This is Libby Road and the Sound Epistemology Podcast. This podcast is a recording of our SE 101 room in the Street Epistemology Club on the Clubhouse Discussion app, in which we had Eddie Tracy as our special guest. Eddie has lots of experience conducting formal street epistemology and uploads those conversations onto his YouTube channel, Deep Discussions. And I'll have a link to that channel in the description so you can check it out. Our room included some questions we had for Eddie, some discussion on some common criticisms that we face as practitioners of the approach, and a lively discussion about privilege. Also be sure to check in about some changes happening soon for the SE 101 room, and I hope you will find this episode of the Sound Epistemology Podcast helpful. Let's get started. All right, so yes, uh, everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, SE 101 room uh, in the Studio Epistemology Club, a room for creating critical thinkers. Uh, we are currently taking questions from uh, folks who are interested in learning more about street epistemology. Uh, today we have Eddie Tracy with us um, to help answer all your questions. I also invite you to uh, 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 bookmark his uh, YouTube uh, channel that is uh, linked in the top of the room uh, if you want to check out more, more of his work. Uh, yeah, so uh, please raise your hands uh, if you would like to ask a question, and uh, we'll bring you on stage. Uh, we just ask that once your question has been answered, that you bring yourself back down to the audience, uh, so we can bring the next person up on stage. Uh, if you'd rather not come on stage, um, you can feel free to send me a back channel message. Um, you can tap on my on my profile. Um, I'm the the guy with the uh, barrel fish. PTR, and uh, click on message, and uh, I'll get the message, and uh, you can also check my responses in the uh, back channel uh, button in the bottom right-hand corner of the uh, Clubhouse app, uh, iOS or Android. It's a little paper airplane. Um, Yeah, so this room has been created as a learning environment, uh, and it is uh, being recorded. Uh, Eddie, if you want to uh, maybe tell the, the audience a little bit about yourself, and then we'll pass it on to uh, David. Great. Okay. Uh, so thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Eddie. Um, like a lot of people, I got into street epistemology because I saw some of Anthony's videos, and uh, and I just decided... Um, that I, I wanted to give it a try once I started uh, watching Anthony's videos. And before Anthony asked the question, um, I started to, um, I, I basically started to hear the question that, I, that I, I would want to ask before Anthony asked it. And so I realized that I it was getting the hang of it. And so I, I, I gave it a try and uh, went out into the park, started recording uh, talks and I really, really, really enjoyed it. So I was doing it for about three years, um, with, uh, with limited time and limited equipment, but it was still, it was still really fun. Um, and unfortunately because of the, the pandemic, I, I haven't done a lot lately. Um, I'm, I'm exploring a little bit of SC with my kids and what that looks like. So I have like one video, I think I'm working on a second one. Um, but, uh, I was around when SE was in its formative stages. So I have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of videos where we are trying different techniques and different questions and kind of feeding off of each other. So it's, it's always fun to, to watch the older videos where it wasn't so settled. But, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David, and I'm a student of street epistemology. I'm excited to have Eddie in our room today. Uh, we've had lots of really good uh, rooms 
uh, lately with different practitioners. It's always fun to uh, hear the different perspectives from everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, Eddie, I was wondering if you could give us your understanding of what street epistemology is just to, uh, just to start off. Sure. So street epistemology is basically an attempt to have a conversation with someone else about a particular belief that is usually sensitive in a way that doesn't um, get them defensive and they feel very comfortable talking about um, their reasons. Um, and it's also a, a format for the introduction of other ideas and questions that you can give to someone so they can begin to digest and think about them. And the, the net goal is for one, the, uh, the, the SER to understand what the interlocutor is saying and, uh, and also the interlocutor to, um, think about the questions that we have and as a whole, we are all getting a better understanding and a, and a better view of what it is they believe and why. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, how would you describe the difference between a street epistemology conversation from just a regular conversation that two people would normally have? Um, I think uh, a normal conversation, whether it's heated or it isn't, has two sides. Um, and I don't, if you're doing SE correctly, I don't think the, the person attempting to do SE really has a side necessarily. Um, they have questions and, um, and some things to think about. Or, or they can introduce, you know, particular questions, but we should never really be uh, trying to reach a particular goal or conclusion. It's more about, you know, uh, the methodology and how we came, you know, to those uh, particular beliefs and conclusions. So I do think that if you are thinking to yourself that, all right, you know, they think this, I disagree, and I'm going to try to lead them away from that. I don't necessarily think that that's, that's, that's something different. SE is more about, um, it's all about the person you're talking with. And if you bring in your conclusions uh, that you have into it, it's a little more muddy and, and uh, it turns into some, something similar to a conversation. And it's, and it's, it's particularly hard to do that, but I think that should be the goal. You've got, um, a few uploaded videos of you using SE with your, with your kids, you said, right? Yes. Well, yeah, I, I have but... one, I, I think I have another one working. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen one. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the, what would be different when using it with your kids? Hmm. Um, it's a, it's a little, it's a little more relaxed, but it's also a little more difficult because, you know, you, you know them personally and they may ask the questions, well, well what do you think? Or what is the right answer? Um, and so, um, you have to really resist just in giving them your opinion or giving them conclusion if they um, if they don't uh, they don't have one currently. So, um, but I, I think you know once you do this you know routinely with your with your kids and they understand that you're going to just be asking questions and and you're not going to be giving them any answers. Um, they tend to like it. It's more like a little test and um, they, they kind of get into it and try to answer the best they can. 
So I think it's, uh, I guess, it's way more relaxed. There's not going to be any conflict or anything like that. But you also have to, uh, you you also have to. The kids kind of have to know that that you're in a different um, mode and you're not going to be like you know just telling them the answers necessarily. So it's it's kind of the same idea that you would with anybody else, kind of let them know what you're doing and and almost like get consent in a way. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say um, I, I don't ever really. Hey, you know, is it OK if I ask you questions or anything like that? Um, but, you know, typically from a, a parent child relationship, you're you're telling them how the world works, what's what's going on and you know, they're, they're used to being the ones with questions and, and you would give them answers. Um, and so just letting them know that, okay, so I'm going to be asking questions and you try, you, you think about it and you have to give your answer. And so, uh, they catch on pretty quick though. Do they ever use it with you? And if they do, how does, how does that usually go? <laughs> um, I wouldn't say they use SEME yet. They're they're pretty young. One's eight, one's six. Um, but you know, never say never. And I think they'll probably get to the point where they're going to ask some SE type questions because they've heard me do it. Like for example, uh, just this morning, uh, it's a quite innocent question, but it but it, it was it was interesting for her to ask it. So it was raining today, and they wanted to um, take a walk to our neighborhood park and uh, I let them know that it was raining all night and you know, everything's going to be wet. And uh, they're like, well, how do you know it is? It's, it's wet. I'm like, well, look outside. Is it rain rains everywhere? And they're like, okay, but you don't know what's, you know, uh, at the park, maybe it's not wet there. <laughs> I was like, okay, I see what you're doing there. Like, obviously I know that it's going to be wet because rain uh, gets everywhere, but uh, I thought it was an interesting question. <laughs> Yeah, I recently went out um, and picked a spot and tested some of the equipment that I have uh, to to start doing one on one uh, formal SE conversations out out at the park or whatever. Um, and I was wondering because you've been doing formal SE conversations with the camera and everything for a couple of years now, right? Or at least two years. Yeah. Like two to three. Like yeah. That. yeah. So if somebody were to want to go out and do this formally uh, in that situation, do you have any tips on, uh, on someone like me that that's just starting to actually go out and, and, and uh, conduct these interviews? Um, my main advice is just go and do it. Uh, don't overthink it. Don't think you have to have a bunch of box checked to start. Um, even if your first couple talks don't go well and you wouldn't want, it to, wouldn't want to upload it, um, you can still record it and then just never upload it and learn, but you definitely want you know, a good conversation to be recorded. Uh, and once you have those, once you start the conversations, uh, everything else falls in place. The hardest, the hardest thing to do is just, just to get started. So whenever someone's asking me, you know, what should I know when, before I get started is you don't really need to know much. Your, your interest is peaked already to want to start and that's enough. You just have to start and then everything else falls into place. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's encouraging. Um, yeah, the motivation it, will come after like your, your, your nerves are probably what's holding you back. But once you just do it, and you realize how easy and fun it is, um, and what question you could have asked, and yada, 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 the, the floodgates open, and you just want to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, I kind of got that. Um, I went out with Reed out to US, UCLA once. Um, which was pretty amazing. I mean, what better way to get your feet wet in, in uh, actual, in real life uh, SE? Yeah, that was fantastic. And, but I've never gone out like with my own gear 
in, in my own neighborhood and done it yet. So um, we did kind of a test the other day. And um, yeah, it's, I, I can't wait to, to do some more. Um, what, what sets you apart from other practitioners? Can you think of anything? Um, I've been told that I'm really good with analogies. And so uh, in my talks, I will come up with an analogy that fits the type of question I'm asking or the type of idea I'm trying to portray. Um, and it's, uh, for the, from what I'm hearing, it's, it, it applies pretty well. Um, so a lot of times you'll see, you know, as years they adopted the uh, idea of a, um, the Tic Tac or the, you know, the Ferrari examples and, and stuff like that. Um, there's certain types of analogies or thought exercises that we, we use to, to get at the core of the question of what we're trying to ask. Um, and some of my videos, I've, I've come up with some of my own that, that helps them understand what I'm asking and also sometimes why I'm asking them. So, uh, like one, one example is, um, the, uh, I've heard a lot of good things, um, when I'm using gra the, my gravity exercise as a way to portray falsification. Because sometimes falsification is an, a difficult idea to to communicate to people, and uh, so this this particular one, I, I, before I ask them what could, uh, what indicates that um, their test is a failure, I'll first explain that um, when I hold my pen out, and I let them know that. Um, Every time I let go of this pen, it drops, um, and it it consistently works. Gravity consistently works, but even though it has never failed, I do know what it looks like when it if it did. So if I let it go and it and it floated or it went down slowly or it went left or went right, those are ways for me to un to know that uh, gravity is failing or my understanding of gravity is not correct. Uh, and so then once I explain that, I ask, how do you know, you know, how do you know if uh, what you're, what you believe is actually incorrect? And so I think following up with that analogy helps people separate the idea of it has failed versus uh, what indicates whether it failed which is a huge distinction. So a lot of times people will say, well, I know it hasn't failed, it, it works every time. And they're not necessarily addressing the, if it did, what would it look like? Yeah, the, the gravity analogy is a good one. Um, and I was thinking of another analogy that I, I think you brought up in one of your videos. Um, and I, when I was kind of trying to formulate how to ask this, I got a message from somebody from some of the in the audience that I think is referring to this analogy. But when we're trying to figure out um, reasons that if we're not available, uh, how much would that affect the confidence that the that the claim is accurate? Um, and from what I remember, and I'm probably going to butcher this, maybe you can kind of set me straight. But so like if you have a dish and there's a certain spice in it, if we took the spice away, how would that affect the flavor of the dish? Right. And and the, the person that was asking this in the audience mentioned jambalaya. I'm pretty sure it's the same analogy. But I, I thought that was fantastic. Like there's, it's, sometimes it's hard to kind of explain, okay, well, it, um, if this, if this reason doesn't affect your confidence, then maybe we can talk about a reason that does affect it. Um, can you, can you uh, walk us through that analogy maybe? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a jambalaya um, ex, uh, exercise. And the reason why I um, came up with that is because 
a lot of the times when you ask someone if this reason that you hold is why you believe this or why you're so confident in, um, or sorry, this reason you hold is, is why uh, you're so confident in this belief. When you say, what if that wasn't true? It seems combative. It seems like a threat. To, and maybe they, they have never even considered that not being true. And it's a little scary to even consider. Um, and so the jambalaya exercise or thought um, idea is that I'm not necessarily saying this ingredient isn't in the dish. I'm just saying, what if it wasn't? Would that affect the spiciness? Um, so like I'll... I'll I'll ask them if they've ever had jambalaya and jambalaya is famous for being very spicy, um, but there's so many ingredients in it. Um, most people don't know what in it actually makes it spicy. Um, is it the bell peppers? Is it the seasoning? Is it the broth? Um, and, and if we were trying to, we would try to figure out what is making it spicy by taking ingredients out. That, that would be one way to, to do it. Um, and then, if if we talk to the chef that made the dish and we and he said this is what makes it spicy and then if we actually took out that ingredient and it was still spicy um what what does that mean what is it, is, is the chef not aware of what actually makes it spicy or are they you know sort of thing and so uh when you when you approach it that way it's not as threatening it's more about figuring out what exactly is the reason that they're so confident. Um, and a lot of people haven't thought about that to such a degree of like, is it, is it the main reason? Is it just a little reason? Uh, and when you do it that way, it's more empowering to the, to the person you're talking to because they get to really think about like, okay, it's safe to think about this. What if that wasn't true? Would I still believe? I would. Okay. Well then, maybe that's not the reason uh, this dish is so spicy, or maybe that's not the reason why you're so confident. And so it becomes like an, a, a sort of exploration of the weight of their confidence, not necessarily like, ha, you know, that's not true. You shouldn't be so confident sort of thing. Yeah. I think that's a, a fantastic way of explaining, explaining that. Um, yeah. It's, it's really helpful. Um, what, what do you think is the, from your experience is the most, uh, misunderstood idea about what street epistemology is? Um, I think it's the idea that we are, uh, here to, We're here to change someone's conclusions. Now, we're definitely here to um, get people to think about why they believe um, and, and maybe ch challenge weak reasons versus strong reasons and think about that. So we're, we're definitely, um, we discriminate against certain methods versus others uh, by asking certain, you know, questions, we, we realize it's going to expose, you know, uh, a flaw in certain reasonings and methods. But I don't think that necessarily applies to conclusions. Uh, so we should be, um, we should have no, uh, what's it, what's it called? Uh, weight on what conclusion we want. Um, and this applies to conclusions that we agree with. Um, someone can can uh, believe something that has a lot of good, you know, reasoning and evidence and, and methodology, yet they're not using that. They're using a really bad methodology to reach uh, a conclusion that we happen to agree on. And so I think we, the misunderstanding is that um, although we're being very nice and um, cordial, is that we ultimately want a, a particular conclusion. And um, I don't think that that's the case. Uh, what you can say is that we want a particular 
strength of methodology to be uh, adopted. Got it. Yeah. Well, I should say not not a particular methodology, but a methodology that uh, is the best. And so, if we don't know about the bet, you know, know about it, we we should be able to adopt it. But we are trying to have strong reasons for you know believing something, good reasons. Right. Uh, how do you prepare before? having an SE conversation. Different people do different things to kind of um, get in the right mindset, I guess, and figuring out what their what their goal is. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you do before the conversation even starts. Okay. Well, for me, um, I'm a very laxed kind of guy. Um, I, I think I I don't have a lot of emotional impulses uh, or anything like that. I'm, I'm I'm generally a pretty relaxed guy who you know isn't looking for a fight. Uh, so what's most important to me is that I have a good meal before I <laughs> before I start, and and then because you know if I'm a little hangry, I'm in, not in the right mindset. Uh, so if I just take care of myself, make sure you know if I'm going to be out there for three hours that I, I eat beforehand, um, I can, I, my body can relax. And, and so I, and I can kind of just, uh, do my thing. Um, but for, for other people, it may be a little different. It may be harder to get in the right mindset where you're literally setting aside all of your beliefs and your conclusions, uh, and you know, are going to be thinking about someone else's, um, sometimes it can be hard to, like have a clean slate in that manner. Um, and generally when people say, oh man, I could never do SE because it gets me so frustrated when I hear this and that and X, Y, and Z. Uh, that, that's really not an, an issue with me because I'm, I never, I understand that my conclusions and beliefs are, are, are to the side and I don't even have to address them. And, I, and my job is not to even put them into the conversation in fact you should be you know having the conversation as if you've never heard these you know these reasons before so yeah kind of a strange answer but that's that's usually what i do <laughs> no that's great i think that's good advice you know taking care of yourself making sure that that your body is prepared as far as you know uh not not having the chance of, you know, being hungry or, you know, cause that can really affect how our, how our brain works and stuff. Yeah. My brain's probably going to go, all right, let's wrap this up. Let's get to the conclusion or let's get, not get to let's the, you know, assume that's what they mean. Um, let's not explore this any deeper, you know? So you're kind of like on a, on a time crunch instead of just relax and let them go where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a few examples of things not to do like even if it's just within the conversation itself like uh things that we should avoid um i think the easiest one is to assume you understand what they're saying um and you repeat that assumption um, and try to attempt to move on instead of asking what the assu what your assumption you're making. So what can happen a lot, uh, especially to people who've been doing, doing SE for a while is that you see a pattern of common reasoning. Um, and so you kind of get comfortable moving on to, okay, they're going to go here and then they're probably gonna go here. So I'm just going to skip that step and go straight to the meat of what I think, uh, what usually diverges, um, you know, uh, or the, the, the meat of what, uh, what the issue is when in reality, someone might not have taken that, that left turn they took a right. And so it can, and, uh, what tends to happen is, um, you, you end up being a little more combative 
instead of really listening and take having them take you where they want to take you. Um, so I would say just be don't, never really assume you understand where the conversation is going. Every single question has to be asked so they can affirm that if you think they're going to go left, they go left. If you think they're going to go right, they go right. And they're making the calls. And it's not necessarily you um, just assuming, even if 90% of people follow that reasoning. Yeah, that resonates really well with me. Uh, my buddy and I, filmed ourselves going through the SE survey. You're familiar with the the survey, the truth survey? Yeah, so um, I think there's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, re I remember that, yes. Yeah, yeah, so we, we filmed ourselves going through the survey and then, you know, we're slowly editing it and making an episode, uh, a YouTube episode for each statement on the survey. And as we're editing it, we're realizing how little we really understood each other. And like, we're spending hours going over what we've said and we're still finding spots where it's like, oh, so that's what you meant. Um, you know, things like that. So it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting how little we understand each other in that specific situation. And so it just makes me think about all the other situations that we have in the, in the, in the world, um, where we, we think we understood somebody and it's, it's kind of pretty obvious now that, uh, chances are you, you don't really have a really um accurate interpretation of of what they were saying or what their position was so um yeah it's it, it's really crucial to understand you know what what you were saying like don't assume that you understand them and don't assume that you already know what they're going to say or what their position is because you know the it, it, the survey exercise is a it's a great demonstration of 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 uh of that being not always the case so um yeah so uh just want to iterate reiterate what uh, early said earlier um that this is a q a session anybody can come up on stage if you want to ask a question just raise your hand we're also um opening it up for um a, a claim or a conclusion that somebody wants to examine uh, with Eddie, a, a, a street epistemology demonstration. So if anybody's interested in that, um, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring you up and you can join the conversation. Um, Alfonso, early, do you have any questions um, for Eddie while we wait for other questions? I, uh, I love the don't assume anything uh way of putting it um and uh i think what sc has done for or against me <laughs> is um i go into rooms now on clubhouse and uh i i just can't say anything because i used to have a, a mind that was incredibly reactive and uh, i had a lot to say but you know, with uh, don't assume anything. Let them explain, right? Let 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 the people who who are speaking or who are really fired up about saying something um, share their thoughts, their journey. What are they? Where are they coming from? And uh, so I, I I I listen for and also because of the fact that people are. Um, there's a lot of people who have this reactiveness perhaps that I used to have more of before. Um, and, they, they, you know, you don't get to speak much anymore. Just ask a couple of questions that sound interesting to you. But the rest of the time I just spend listening. And, um, and, and yeah, I enjoy very small rooms now. I, it's very hard for me to be in a large stage where... People are just butting in, and, and, and you, and then the listen. Also, the listening skills that you get from 
practicing a C, make you feel like uh, a lot of people talk past each other a lot, right? They're not listening to each other. They cut each other off. And, uh, and yeah, I think it, I can enjoy conversations like that because you, you hear many different perspectives and sometimes there's a lot of things that are being said that you might have not heard before. But uh, yeah, but totally come out of the debate mode, basically. Some things that you can actually um, help with when people start, you know, making very big assumptions, uh, even when it's like a one-on-one, -on -one, you can help people not do that by just not uh, helping them in that endeavor. So like the ultimate like example of this would be like, you get into a conversation uh, with someone about a particular topic and then they, before they start getting into it, they will ask, okay, so are you Republican or are you Democrat? Or are you an atheist or are you a Christian? Uh, and so what they're trying to do is make a blanket assumption about where you're um where they think you're going to be representing uh, instead of the actual topic <laughs> uh and i i like to just deny them that and, and they say are you a republican or democrat i'm like um well is that relevant like what do you think like what does it even mean to be a republican or democrat how do i know like uh and, and uh you it, it helps them kind of think about the topic at hand rather than than where you're coming from or where they think you're gonna going to say, and you don't want to help them make assumptions. Yeah, it seems like a a tough line to walk. Where on one hand, you know, you you want them to feel comfortable in the in the conversation and try to answer their their questions but at the same time you don't want to influence um their answers to the to the questions that you're asking right like um it, it that that kind of line seems like it's one of the more difficult things to navigate uh throughout the conversations wouldn't you say yeah i mean i think you can just be very honest about why you're um not being upfront about that information and i and i say you know what well uh, i'd rather not answer that question because uh you're you were going to assume a lot about what what i think but i'll definitely tell you after this conversation and, and you may be surprised you may not be surprised but let's let's work out what we're actually talking about it you know yeah like um saving saving their questions for for the end so that they're not influenced yeah i mean in that example you're you're probably not even doing an se discussion that's just a helpful tip to help people not be uh, uh you know to not jump to conclusions even in a, a typical conversation um you know because nothing's worse than like what well, you know like hey let's talk about you know vaccinations and they're like okay well you're democratic or republican and then you then you give them the answer and then they're like okay well you know and then they just like off topic completely and uh they assume certain things and whatnot yeah one subject that i've been thinking about a lot lately is how to make how to make um how to make it more entertaining for the viewer. Like, you know, you obviously you and the interlocutor, you know, you're in this kind of space together and an audience in that particular moment really isn't at the forefront. But at the same time, if you're promoting it and you want other people to watch it and learn um, how to have better conversations with people, um, do you have, do you have any ideas on how to make it more entertaining for the viewer? Cause I mean, it's super entertaining for me, but I feel like I know what to look for in an SE conversation, right? Like, um, I I'm looking for really good questions to ask, 
Um, but if somebody has no idea what it is, um, I feel like a lot of times it can be a little bit dull for that audience member. And I was, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking about how to, how to make it, uh, I guess more entertaining is the best way to put it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I, what I generally do is, um, you know, when I first started doing videos, um, I wasn't the best. And, and so to indicate that to my audience, I was rewatching my videos and then leaving, um, subtitles on not subtitles, but just text on the bottom about why I asked a certain question. Um, if I messed up, uh, what a better question would be now that I think about it. Um, and generally, uh, like give, uh, them some things to look, look for and realize like where I made a mistake, where their body language showed something where something I noticed. Um, and so they can kind of get in my head a little bit so they see it, so they can see what I'm doing and why, um, and as well as they can see me make mistakes and uh learn from that as well and so i I continue to do that uh, as i got better at it and uh people people really liked it they said it was it was uh it was good to see you know uh to see why i was asking a particular question what i thought about it what i thought about what they said you know uh stuff and stuff like that um there was also an attempt that i made to make a game out of a particular conversation um and i think i talk a little bit about it um with an interlocutor it's one of my top five videos i think it had to do with uh prophecy but he approached me as i was writing it down and trying to figure it out um and so we talked a little bit about it um but ultimately i came to the conclusion that uh, a game might make it a little more interesting for the interlocutor and the audience but by applying points and and uh sort of a um you're doing good or doing bad uh thing to someone's um someone's answers it really doesn't help them reflect as much as it distracts them from me judging them if that makes sense yeah i think so kind of taking different approaches depending on the the conversation partner that you have. Um, I think uh, another thing that I've been kind of thinking about is, you know, some practitioners um, say that it's okay to have persuasion as your goal. Like if it's okay to have the goal of changing somebody's mind in an essay conversation and um, others say that that should not be your goal. Um, I was wondering where you stood on that and maybe you can kind of explain uh, your position on that a little bit. Yeah. So I would say the, my, my answer to that is actually, uh, something I already answered, and that is the distinction between the methodology and the conclusion. So um, I do want to persuade people to have better methods and better um, reasoning for what they believe, um, but I don't necessarily want them to reach the same conclusion because if the methodology is really good and we get new information and that changes the conclusion, I really don't want uh, to people be um married to that conclusion or or uh be too confident in a conclusion that is now shown to be not as likely or something like that and, and so i think um sure we definitely we we would definitely want to influence them and persuade them with to have better reasons um but that the conclusion always should be interchangeable. I, I definitely don't want to persuade people to believe a particular thing, but I definitely want them to have good reasons. Uh, and whatever that conclude, whatever the conclusion is, uh, it was, it is what it is based off of the information we have. Um, 
And this actually came up in one of the presentations I did to one of my, um, this, this atheist group in Tyler. Um, and they're like, well, what if someone, you know, believes, you know, in evolution, uh, why would you want to have a conversation with them? It's like, well, um, you know, if they believe it because their teacher taught it to them, that's, I think that's not necessarily the strongest reason. And I would, I would, uh, address that and talk about that reasoning. Uh, and they're like, well, you, you want them not to believe in evolution? It's like, it's not necessarily that I do or I don't. It's about having good reasoning. And uh, like I said before, I think that the conclusion is something that needs to be no commitment to it. It's just how you get there is what is what I want to influence. Can yeah, I ask so... a question, David? Yeah, 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 go for it. Um, so real quick, I'm actually going to be passing on the uh, the baton to uh, Alfonso um, for the uh, for my role. Uh, I'm going to be stepping out. Something came up, uh, but I wanted to ask the question to Eddie regarding that that last few comments you made. Um, there's been a lot of objections or criticism, I guess, towards SE when it comes to this idea, even even of uh, any sort of uh, expectation of consistency or having good reasons, where uh, the fact that there may be any expectation in that we expect people to think differently or to process things, to process things differently, or quote unquote better, you know, according to epistemology, the it, it, it seems to be a lot of criticism or, or some criticism around that. Um, for, for me in the past, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. I I do agree with the thing with the last thing you said, like the beliefs themselves or the conclusions. I'm, I'm not married to any single one either. Um, and you know, for example, I, I've had I've heard people that have kind of arrived at a conclusion that they believe in a god or uh, a higher power, even though um, because of uh, practical reasons, etc. Uh, and the the way that they got there, I you know I kind of respect m myself personally. But I'm wondering, what do you think about the fact that? There's a, I seem to hear a lot of criticisms where people are not okay, even with the implication of us having that expectation that people should be thinking a certain way or, um, you know, having good methods uh, of thought. Yeah, I think I, what uh, what I think about when you bring up that uh, objection is that people tend to almost uh, agree that the, the truth isn't really that important. It's the, the benefit of the belief comes into play more than the actual truth of the claim. So if, if the truth of the claim uh, is, is greatly negatively like impacting someone's life, it may not be uh, uh, something that we should probably pursue. And it's, it's, it's better to just, uh, um have a false belief that that um that is very beneficial and that helps society and so that's that tends to be the rub when people talk about you know you shouldn't assume uh methodology that there's good and bad because once you're on the same page that the truth matters and we want to pursue the truth uh, everything else follows that certain methods are better at it than than others um and we can definitely have that conversation about what methods are good and what met methods are weaker, stronger, et cetera. Um, but all of that goes away if you can't uh, agree that the truth is what we should be pursuing. And that tends to be the rub that, you know, sometimes the truth has, isn't that important. It, what matters is how it affects their lives. Would you, would, is that kind of what you were going for? Um, uh, yes, indeed. And, and I think probably this is from maybe more homework for myself uh, of thinking of a way of communicating that as to not 
um, trigger that criticism, right? Because the, it, it sometimes, and again, I'm kind of just relaying some of the things I've heard. It's not, I really enjoy SE. I like the idea. I want to learn how to uh, ex uh, do it more. Um, but it seems like that the moment that there's any sort of implication or verbiage implying that you're going to uh, have any sort of expectation or steer people in a certain way, then the criticisms fall. I, I, with that said, I do want to reiterate that one thing. You know, for example, with Alfonso's conversations that he's had, I, I think I've seen two of them. And I have had two SE conversations. The criticism seems to be happening and coming more from people that don't experience it. From my experience, every time I have a conversation, people seem to want to come back for more. They have a very positive opinion about what just happened. And so I don't know, there's something about the verbiage of explaining what we're doing that triggers the criticism versus when I'm actually doing SE, the person and I are not having any issues and they're not feeling manipulated. They're not feeling like they're being controlled or anything of the sort. But there's something about explaining SE that elicits the criticism more than it is actually going through with it because people just seem to have a very positive experience when they do SE sessions, at least for me and what I've seen Alfonso doing as well, um, uh, you know, as well as, you know, Reed and others, uh, Anthony, obviously. So th that, that's what I'm kind of working on. Like, how do I talk about SE without making it seem like something that we're not actually doing? And I clearly see it because I watch the videos, I see the conversations and we're not doing that. Yeah, I think I think the, the objection that, um, you shouldn't be influencing or, um, you know, uh, having a, a particular goal of methodology, better methodology is basically, to me, I almost want to say it's an admission that it's, it is, it is working, it is effective, and they don't like what it's doing. Um, and so, I think it, it comes from a place of fear more than actual constructive criticism, because if, if they wanted to be to help and say, you know, you really shouldn't um, uh, have any expectations of this methodology, they would give you a specific example um, of what would be a better way to do it. Um, but what they're really, what, what I hear uh, from, from them is basically don't influence and that's basically saying don't talk to people about their beliefs leave them alone and so that's a, that's not a better way of doing it that's just hey stop stop influencing people and so they i i don't know where you would go from that like you don't think that we should uh influence each other about what we believe you know Right, right. I get. It. Go ahead, David. I'm I'm gonna step out here shortly, but if you wanna go ahead and respond. Oh sure. Um. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being here early. Um. I I was just gonna offer, uh, maybe an illustration that might help with this. Cause this this is a great topic. Um. I think it's important that we have ways to respond to criticisms um and i think what might help is if if we so in street epistemology we think of um this pyramid that's cut in the thirds and so you have the the base piece the bottom third which is the the most important um then we have the middle piece which is uh somewhat important and then we have the very top piece which is the the least important and the very top piece is the is the what so like what what the claim is what the conclusion is and then what's supporting that is a little bit more important uh which is the why what why do you hold this conclusion and then under that that's holding everything down is the how how did you uh how did you figure out that those reasons are good or um how 
um, how, what, what method are you using to decide that those reasons are sufficient for having high confidence in the what? And so um, maybe you can kind of uh, help me with this, but maybe it, the, the higher you or the lower you go down um, on the pyramid, the less you want to have that kind of persuasion goal, um, depending on, you know, up and down the pyramid. Does that kind of make sense? Um, can you give me an example, a simple example, um, that would place those three spots? Um, maybe I can think about it a little better. Yeah, I'll try. Like, um, we'll, we'll pick an easy one. Um, vaccines are dangerous, right? So that's the what. And then the why is um, because, uh, because my, um, my spiritual teacher tells me that that's the case. And then the how would be um, I decided that that's a good reason because um, other things that that the spiritual leader tells me have come come true. So the what we want to focus on is the the how mainly. And so the, the higher I go up in the pyramid, the less I want to have persuasion as my goal. Oh, okay. I misunderstood you. And I thought you meant the opposite, like the lower you go, um, the, the list, less persuasion. And I was, when I was I confused, have, I was like, yeah, I, may have I was it like, that way. Uh, you might want to give an example. So I understand, but yeah, yeah I, yeah, apologize. I would say, yeah, you definitely want to, uh, you know, ha you want to ask some questions that, um, see, here's the thing when, when, even when we're at the peak of influence, um, seeing how they came to their conclusion, um, it's still not something that we're just telling them or assuming that we have the right how, um, but a question that challenges the, the the reliability of the how um and so even at the peak of what we want to influence um it's still a question answer format in which they could totally blow us away and we can learn something new and uh it's it's not something that we're like okay we're, let me just tell you that that's a bad reason here's a better one and let's move on to the next one. You know, it's 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 still pretty. Um, it, it, it's an influence, but it's a very very like uh, inviting uh, discussion. Great. Yeah. Thanks for explaining that. I think we can probably talk a lot more about that. Um, we do have. Victoria here from the audience. Welcome to the stage. Hi, thank you. Um, I just, I found Early's question um, really interesting and I've come across that myself. Um, and I wondered if perhaps some different phrasing might um, bring out a, a different sort of um, uh, thought on this. I understand the history of street epistemology and that it is used um, as a way to change religious people into atheists, for lack of a, a longer explanation. Um, but I have been, I learned about it from you guys here on Clubhouse uh, the the phrasing street epistemology, and the entire time that I've listened to dozens of these uh, rooms and conversations, I've seen it less about 
the practice of street epistemology being uh, with the goal to change someone's mind, although that can be an outcome, I've seen it more as the person, uh, the street epistemology practicer, let's say, speaking to the interlocutor, that's the person who has the belief, right? Um, And working with them in a service. So it seems to me that the person with the street epistemology skills um, is servicing the other person and helping them get to the how and the why. And it's less likely or less about the changing of the mind because I've listened to several, several of these um, practicers <laughs> uh, talk to people here on the stage and they've never come to a conclusion. They've said, oh, okay, yeah, this seems like a good time to stop here. There's never been sort of um, a result or a, an end goal, but it has been a service to the other person. And I think that's why Early has experienced what he experiences when people thank him for the conversation and they come back for more because they feel like they they actually feel heard because they have been heard. The person can't ask those questions without really listening. So well, there may be um, the opportunity to change someone's mind, ultimately, I, I don't see that as what you guys do. Um, it is is that clear? Does that maybe help a little bit? And perhaps that can be used to explain it, explain street epistemology without giving the impression that it's a bunch of people out to change people's minds and make people think the way they do. Because to me, it's not about what the practitioner thinks at all. Yeah, I, I think um, there there is, you know, a lot of truth to how SE started and uh, its goals uh, have definitely diverted from its its origins. And so I think, you know, the more we can talk about that and admit that, the, be- the better people can understand where SE is now. Because if we were trying to do SE um, as, just like uh, the Peter Boghossian's first book about street epistemology, um, we we're doing it horribly, <laughs> you know? Uh, we're not doing we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing um and so i think it's it's a growth story about um what it came from and what it is now um but i suspect that people who still hold that we're secretly trying to change conclusions even though we don't uh say we are it's they 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 probably think that we're very very sneaky and you know, you know, we we practice SE a certain way, and then you know, we go into a closed room, and we're like all oh, like hail Hydra, you know. <laughs> uh, so right, but, right. Um, I think um, it's just a matter. You you can't really prove to someone that you're genuine about what you're saying in that way. I think uh, it's just important to keep uh, keep true to what you're what you're um actually doing and um you know definitely don't don't lie if you are uh trying to reach a certain conclusion when attempting se you can say you know yeah i was definitely doing that and uh uh and and what what you call that is you know up to you i guess you can say you're doing se poorly or you know i'm using se in this way Ultimately, it's a collection of methods, um, and you you either believe someone who who is not interested in a particular inclusion, or they are, you know. So, yeah, yeah, right. I, I, what you just said, though, I think I've seen here on Clubhouse at least most of the the practitioners um, admit that their position in the beginning and say, I'm not here to promote this, but for full disclosure, I am a non-believer. Um, but I do have questions about your belief. 
And I, I think that that's refreshing uh, for the person who's being asked the questions. Eddie, I'm wondering if you could describe if there's a moment uh, here, I don't know what the schedule is for your room, but you just said something about the origins of street epistemology and how the way it's practiced now is not, it would be considered it being done poorly and, and that there's been an evolution. And, um, and so, while I know a little bit of how it started or, or the purpose of what it was used for. Um, can you tell me what you mean by that about what the people now would be considered um, not proper use of it or how they're, they're not um, you, uh, performing it correctly and how that may be changed if you, if you know? Yeah, um, I'm probably not the best person to describe this in full detail. One, because I never read that book, which um, a lot of people are surprised about. Um, I mainly have taken up um, on uh, SE just based off of Anthony's videos. But I will say that, um, you know, the the book that started it all was uh, a book by Peter Boghossian, uh, A Manual for Creating Atheists. And right then and there, that should tell you everything you need to know that the goal is to make atheists. And so it's committed and married to a, um, a particular conclusion and everything else is just a, a method to arrive at the desired result versus a complete uh, um, divergence from a particular c conclusion and focusing on methodology and the conclusion lies where, where you know, where it, uh, or it goes wherever the method takes us. Um, so, uh, and, and there's definitely been some, uh, some rewrites um, since then, I know that the definition of faith was a big one, um, which was actually brought up by some apologists um, many years ago about you know, we're using a particular definition of faith that isn't uh, uh, applicable to everyone. And so one of the things that SE does now is ask for definitions of words so we don't assume what people mean. Um, and in the manual, it was like, okay, here's what faith is and here's how it is unreliable. And so the evolution from focusing on a particular conclusion and instead uh, a methodology, um, it's come a long way uh, from that and how we, how we actually listen to people the best we can so we can ask the right questions to see um, if uh, to, to help them reevaluate where their their reasoning um, led them and where it could possibly um, uh, be examined again to to find a different path that that uh, they, maybe they have never thought about. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, I I, I do wonder if it might benefit that that it be called something else maybe because if people look it up and they always know what that history is if somebody says oh i practice street epistemology and then they look it up and it always refers to turning people into atheists that might um give them a different opinion of it um i guess for me too i'm, I'm a very curious person which is why this really interests me this style of conversation and i do understand that that there is a difference between it being sort of a two-way thing and and really practicing street epistemology with somebody and the consent involved and such but the benefits i find with it for the practitioner is that that when we ask those questions the person with the belief might have a how that we've never thought about yeah. and so you know we might also learn something uh, through that, whether it's not that I don't, I, you know, I don't think that there'll be uh, street epistemology atheists turning into religious people uh, through the religious person's how, but I do think that it opens our minds and that we can't go into it as a practitioner thinking that we know all of the hows and the whys and um, expecting that. I think that that might 
cause a feeling of for, from others that we ha have some arrogance. Um, but no, I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate these rooms. So thank you for answering those questions. Hey, and, I, and I want to add, and I want to add the, well, Victoria nailed it, right? So um, definitely I, I went through that already myself where I've realized that the idea, this idea of debating or having the goal of proving that, oh, I may be having signal issues. Can you guys yeah, hear me? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, you want to try again? Um, yeah, it should be coming back here. Um, okay, yeah, so all I I'll make it short. So I went through that where I realized that it's not about having the goal of uh, uh, of having the person believe a certain thing, and I'm very happy that I gave that up. I'm, I'm, I really, overall, I don't pursue that, and I, you know, I've I've actually don't frequent as much on these stages anymore uh, because of that. And so, what I've noticed is that sometimes a believer will give a good reason why they believe. But there's still this desire to go in and change the person or change the way they're thinking or prove them wrong. And, uh, you know, I think that that's probably often what why conversations often uh, go the wrong way. Uh, and, and why I'm kind of happy that I'm, uh, you know, I kind of started this journey a lot thanks to Alfonso, actually. Um, the other thing I wanted to address from earlier. Um, Eddie said something that I think is key uh, when it comes to the way I look at the criticism that, that I received. And it's that, you know, he said, you know, that there may be fear or, or something else at work when people are, are, are dishing out these criticisms. Because, and just to reiterate, uh, it just seems like the people that are involved in the SC method are not having this issue. It just seems like it's only outside people looking at us talking about it describing it and so you have a few people that will have this this opinion right and uh, i really appreciate the fact that victoria took the time to to come up and, and say what she said because quite often uh, it just seems like people that are listeners or uh, we've had a lot of those let's just come up here and, and have a, these strong criticisms and but which often leave me mostly confused more than anything but um yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that. I think I think giving up that idea of wanting to convince people, and I, I did come to learn that there are people that believe that have a belief in a higher power that really do have, they have their reasons that work for them. And I have no desire to go in and try to change their epistemology to be like something like mine or something like that. And so, yeah. Uh, real quick, Victoria, uh, I would say that, uh... You know, there, there's a there's there's a level of integrity um, that that I think, uh, like when you were saying, maybe call it something different. I think would would probably be easier, and you won't run into the problem uh, of people thinking it is something that it's not. But I also think that that's a, I feel like it's a level of dishonesty like you're trying to necessarily hide the origin which will probably just make the the trust or or the uh, yeah the trust people have of what you're saying even worse uh, i think there's a level of integrity of saying yep that is that is definitely how it started um but you know we we are going in a different uh, direction and here's why versus uh you know oh we're new testament that's the old testament sort of thing does that make sense um also yeah. Uh, so go ahead. And no, no, it it totally makes sense. I and I I per I appreciate it. I don't see any need to change it. Um, so long as as how we're practicing it, um, is it shows a reason. And and all I was gonna add, and I, I kind of interrupted you, so maybe I'll add something after you go. Oh, the other thing I was gonna say was that, um, it is very fulfilling you know to completely let go of the conclusions you have for that time being when you're talking with someone and even though they've completely diverged from from the way you would reason through something 
it's it's uh it's actually quite fun to follow them through this uh through their i guess for lack of a better term the rabbit hole of of how they think um and so you know you're exploring a whole new area and so 99 percent of what you believe or the reasons why you came to your conclusions uh occurred because you turned left at this thought instead of right but it, uh, and then everything else stems from that but if you find someone who turned uh, the other way it's it's like you're exploring a whole new area and so you're like oh okay cool so th then what about this and then what about that and how does this work and, and so it becomes this like adventure assuming you can put your beliefs to the side right um it, so david can i just add Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so I've listened a lot and wanted to come up before, but um, now that I'm here, I might as well just get it all out. But uh, one of the things that uh, I appreciate about learning about this, so I'm really happy that you guys have had these rooms and, and that Alfonso and, and Early have taken this into other rooms as well and talked about it more, is I recognize this sort of questioning in some of the therapy I do, and I mean, I'm on the receiving end of the therapy, um, but with a coach and a, a psychologist, when I have um, struggles with things, and it can even be severe past traumas, quite often what's happening now is because of a current belief about something. It's not actually that the trauma has resulted in any physical um, issue. It's a belief stemming from an incident, could be decades earlier. And I find that their line of questioning about, well, why do you think that? And, and you know, how, how did your research come to, you know, support that? Um, goes along the same lines. And so through these rooms and, of course, guidance from some other professionals, I have found that on my own, I'm able to do my own street epistemology on me when I realize that I have a belief that might not be serving me well any longer. Perhaps it did serve me well. And, and I was reminded of this when Early said that he doesn't have a desire to change somebody's belief system if he can see that they have that belief system for a reason. And what I'm noticing is I did have belief systems about certain things about myself that did protect me for many years, but perhaps now they don't serve me as they once did. And, and in fact, by questioning them, I may actually be able to grow and become a happier and healthier person. And so I would invite others to think about it that way as well. And, and perhaps just think about the questions that we would ask as practitioners, but ask them about ourselves regarding our own beliefs. Um, and just being open to uh, allowing an understanding that what we believe may not be the only way to think about something. It may be one of the ways, but when we loosen our grip on our beliefs, um, we often can let go of the crisis energy that is attached to that belief. So I'll just leave it there. I'm listening. You know, uh, can uh, you actually? Sorry, go ahead. I, I was, I was very. I'll make it very quick, Eddie. Um, I heard a. Uh, this is a software developer uh, person online, and he was talking about um, once you enter the the software development world, there's this uh, step in the development process where you have to gather information from like your client or your customer. It involves critically thinking about the desires and the needs that the customer wants and asking good questions and, and understand so you can understand what they want. It was a highlight when the person said that 
in the development, in the learning software development and learning on how to, uh, this is our requirement gathering is the, what I'm referring to for those software developers in the room. The process of requirement gathering and that exercise that you have to go through help the person become a better boyfriend, a better father, a better brother. Uh, and uh, he did, he obviously, he wasn't talking about SE, but he was talking about a process where he has to listen and then ask follow-up questions. Um, and I, I thought that was quite an indirect testimony to this general idea of, you know, critically thinking, listening, and having these type of conversations um, where this person it actually affected more than his career, it affected actually his life as well, which I think is also how SE can believe in. in uh, Victoria, I think uh, I, I agree 110% uh, of everything you just said about uh, beliefs and uh, personal beliefs that one may have as well, 100%. Uh, Victoria, you brought up something that uh, was a, a very serious conversation when SE practitioners uh, started to see a lot of success. Um, and when you mentioned that, you know, uh, uh, a counselor um, was was addressing, you know, uh, if, is a belief serving you? And um, uh, if it is, you may not want to mess with it. And then when it stops, then you can kind of start questioning it. Um, uh, obviously, you know, the belief in God has a ton of implications uh, of other beliefs and it, it's it's a foundational belief for a lot of other beliefs. And so uh, one of the questions that we had to tackle was, you know, is, is, is it always right morally to have someone um, question such a foundational belief? And in what situations would we not want to continue the conversation? Um, there is a video on my YouTube channel that's, uh, I think it's called When Not To Do SE. Um, and I encountered uh, a, a lady that um, she, the re one of the reasons why she still believes in or continues to believe in God is, is because um, a death, she had to make sense of a death of her child. Um, and that was something where it came very obvious to me that uh, I am in a place where I could um, ask questions to instill doubt on such a important belief that she has that you know is going to affect her well-being um and i i did not feel comfortable pursuing that conversation because it, like you're the, the counselor you were speaking of um was saying sometimes it's serving it's serving them um and that's the that's the rub that i was talking about before whether you want to pursue truth or um you want to uh, value the the benefit the belief is giving you, and I think in some situations, some people are definitely not ready to to challenge a particular belief. It's not going to be healthy for them. Maybe if, even if they want to, I, I don't think that some people are ready. And and I'm definitely not qualified to determine whether someone's ready to do that. I'm uh, just a guy asking some questions. Um, and so that's that's a unforeseen responsibility that we had to deal with uh and so i think the consensus was basically like when in doubt bail out like you know you don't you don't want to cause any damage and that's not something that we were prepared for initially this is great this is a a, a really really good topic um, I do have somebody else that wants to come up on stage, but I want uh, Victoria, you to have an opportunity to, um, if you have any any last thoughts you want to share uh, before we we get to Brenda. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. No, I have no further thoughts. I'm happy to go back to the audience. I just want to thank you for taking my questions and engaging in this direction uh, because I haven't um, heard people talk about this and sort of the self street epistemology at all. And, and Eddie, I appreciate the whole when in doubt bow out, um, you know, and, and when I'm talking about, you know, has something served you well, you know, I'm not talking with my therapist about God. It's, it's more like, you know, 
being so defensive or, you know, um, you, you know, not, not being as friendly as I might be, or, you know, that I want to be or whatever, something like that. And so, um, uh, and that comes from, you know, having to protect yourself, but do I need to do that anymore? So that that's more of what I'm talking about that I think could benefit other people, but definitely when we're dealing with death and, and people hoping to see their loved ones when they're, you know, when they die themselves and meet them again, I don't believe in that, but I certainly am envious of those who do when, when, um, you know, I've had a shared, uh, death and the person, you know, my stepmother grieving over my father, she believes she'll see him again. And I don't believe that I will. And I can't help but see that it, it helps her cope. Right. Um, I'm not going to tell her it, it's not true. I just sit and be maybe a bit sadder than her. I don't know. But um, anyway, so thank you very much, you guys. This has been terrific. And I, and um, uh, I'll I'll continue. I'll just uh, go back to the audience now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Stick around. If you have any other questions and there's an opportunity, maybe you can come back on stage and, um, and chat some more. Uh, And while I bring um brenda up i'm just going to do a quick reset this is the se 101 uh room in the street epistemology club a room for creating critical thinkers uh we are taking questions from the audience one at a time if you'd like to ask a question or uh, give a comment uh just raise your hand and we'll bring you up on stage and uh i also want to mention we have eddie tracy today uh, helping us answer your questions. Uh, so go ahead, Brenda. Uh, welcome to the stage. Um, good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Can good you hear time. me? Oh, yes. Okay. yes, loud and clear. Welcome. So how can SE improve conversations when conversations, um, it feels to me, like this is said from or comes from a a place of privilege um because i i don't have that experience that there's anything i can do to improve conversations Uh, i get subjected to verbal sexual abuse on an almost daily basis by people in this application, in other applications, you know, in Clubhouse, in Discord, and and in other social apps, not in real life, but certainly in those apps, um, it is directed, vicious sexual comments every day. And I don't feel like there's anything I can do about it. There isn't anywhere I can go because it's everywhere. There isn't anything I can say because that that doesn't help any. Right? They just they just it just eggs them on. Anything any reaction you make just eggs them on. Right? So I don't see any any space where I can be comfortable and safe. So I would say that um, SE isn't is a method about having conversations about beliefs. It's not necessarily like a defense mechanism or uh, something to, that deals with what you're discussing about abuse. Uh, SE does not definitely doesn't uh, assist you in abusive conversations. And so my my first response would be to leave those uh, conversations as far as where you can have uh you know better conversations um i don't i don't know particularly know where that would be um but i i don't think you should stay in a platform or a conversation or right a group of friends that 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 happens yeah see that's what i mean by it's coming from a place of privilege okay because there isn't anywhere i can go what you're telling me is I can't do 
the things that other people do. I'm not allowed. I have oh, to no, go no. away. I have to go away. But there isn't no, that's not another place. The point is you're assuming that there's somewhere to go, and there no. isn't. Because no, if I, I go, you say, I'm supposed to leave those situations. Well, if I go, because I want to talk about issues, um, either social issues or philosophical or scientific issues. And you're telling me I'm not allowed to. That's what I hear. Um, so you when, mind? When, I say, when I say that um, you shouldn't be a part of those abusive conversations, you take that as me saying you're not allowed to be in there? Right, because let's say we're on a ship. Every room in the ship, I get abused. And you tell me, well, you just shouldn't be in those rooms. Well, that means I jump off the ship. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'd just like to reiterate, I'm not sure where that, uh, the, that wouldn't be a threat. But uh, I'm not necessarily telling you what you have to do. I'm just giving my recommendation to not be part of those conversations. Because um, I, I, the goal is to not be, not be a part of abusive conversation, right? Right. So I should be off the internet. Thanks a fucking lot. Oh, Brenda, do you mind staying a second? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I shared the stage with Brenda. Yeah, I think it was yesterday and a couple of times before this. And um, I just wanted to share how um, someone else who might have been, uh, might have felt the same way Brenda felt, um, had an amazing way of dealing with, with trolls and with uh, people who are quite offensive. And, um, and, and this was, uh, you know, I, I, I was practicing street epistemology and uh, this friend um, although he's an atheist he didn't practice it but he had a you know such an amazing way of dealing with people who came across as um, hardened or dogmatic or perhaps um, but yeah it's a shame uh, Brenda will have to yeah well First of all, I, um, I just want to say that my heart goes out to Brenda. I have no idea the struggles that Brenda is dealing with. Um, but for the people that are still in the audience, um, I want to say that anybody here is, is welcome and safe here in, in this room. Um, or any room that I, that I run, I want everybody to feel like they're welcome. Um, so like I said, I, I don't really know how to address, uh, their question, um, or their comment, but I just wanted to put it out there that this, this room is designed to be safe and comfortable for everyone that wants to join. So, um, it looks like we have, uh, Steve that wants to come up. I'm going to bring Steve up. Uh, you have anything else to say, uh, Eddie, before uh, we get we hear from Steve? Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope everyone knows my intention was not to, you know, tell someone they they should just uh, leave if they don't like the way they're be treating uh, that's definitely not what i was trying to express it but i certainly you know, didn't get that impression from you yeah just like so when, you, know. when you are when you're in abuse if you are in an abusive conversation um i i just or if i was in an abusive conversation i'm not going to try to win them over that it's an unacceptable behavior and so the easiest solution would be to leave now where where can you go besides that there's nowhere else to go that is something you know uh, that that is uh, a, another another problem, and so uh, I, I think you know I'll, um, I I don't have the answer to that, and that was probably the frustration. Thanks. All right, Steve, welcome to the stage. Uh, go ahead and ask your question, or 
or uh, give us your comment. Well, yeah, I just wanted to give some feedback or, or assistance with what just happened with Brenda there. Um, I want to announce like the clear elephant in the room is Brenda is clearly talking about the, the problems of being trans, right? Uh, did you did you catch that part, Eddie? Did you read that in, in between the lines? Um, or no, are you unfamiliar? I want to make any assumption. Okay, well, I, I guess I know Brenda uh, long enough, well enough, and I read between those lines. It seemed obvious, like we're talking about a, a problem of what it's like to be trans. I myself, well, well, let's just say it would be controversial, at least in my own head, as to whether or not I qualify. But I certainly can empathize with uh, the trans community. Um, and I think this is a really important question to consider, right? What she put on the table here of, uh, there is a privilege, right? Of being able to even establish a civil conversation on, uh, let's, let's even say it's the topic that's important to you, one about your well-being, and one that's so prevalent to someone in her position Right. Where it goes to the extreme of being that she can't have a philosophical discussion about something not to do with being trans without somebody trying to poke at her and troll her for being trans. Right. So oh, there's the, the, this sort of big picture abuse that does go on systemically within the society. And that's what she was getting at when she said, you're basically telling me to jump off the ship because there's nowhere to go. Is this room acceptable? Oh, I, 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 I don't think that you were um, really like like pulling anything on her and abusing her, but it, I can understand her frustration and the need to walk away because it was clear that you weren't quite getting what she was implying or talking about there. And uh, it is a big issue for her. So it's understandable why it would, you know, trigger yeah. some very um, uh, strong feelings. Um, well, again, uh, it, it wasn't quite clear to me, um, and I try my best to not assume. Um, and so, if the goal was for me to be um, to, to understand the topic a little more, you know, they can, I think being more specific would would definitely help. But I also don't think that would change necessarily the problem, and that and that is that I didn't have a solution for, and she, and she didn't ha uh, have one either. And so the, mm. the frustration was that. Um, neither of us had one, you know? All right. So let's see. Um, I think you, it was, it was definitely on point to say street epistemology doesn't claim to be the, 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 the end all be all solution to all civil dialogues. Um, that being said, what she was talking about is, is definitely a harsh reality right that mm -hmm. th whether it's for the 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 um the trans community being actively campaigned against or um being such a small easy low-hanging fruit target that uh a, that that um uh bullies tend to go after it it's definitely you know at this sort of point where you just can't even be trans or in a way that that is um, not fully 100% passing um, without, you know, enduring this, this kind of, uh, this, this kind of abuse. So, um, and I, I want to also point out, there's something to be said about how you're framing this, Eddie, when you say uh, she, that, you didn't want to assume. I mean, the, that that's pretty much akin to the issue of colorblindness, right? Like the 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 solution is to not really wipe the slate clean, clean and pretend like you don't understand what the the situation is in the room. I it's, actually didn't legitimately didn't know that to what that's what the topic was. I legitimately okay. Didn't know, and I also wouldn't. Even if I had an indication, I I wouldn't want to assume because that's that's uh that's how we make uh, mistakes in assuming what's you know if I just assume what the what the conversation is about, and I start talking about something else that's uh or addressing a, a different topic, um, 
you know, right. that's not so I understand. I understand if it never occurred to you, right? That that that's fair, and you know, I can't I can't really shame you if you genuinely didn't occur to you. But I think, regardless of of whether or not you would feel like you're making assumptions, you always have, especially with the the skills of SE, you always have the option to ask the question, right? So if it did at least occur to you that she was talking about uh, uh, being trans. Um, it would have been apt, I think, uh, following the the goal of straight epistemology to simply ask the question, are you talking about what it's like to be trans? Is is that what I'm understanding? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, um, but I don't know if that that answer would necessarily help um, the, the conversation because abuse, uh, to me, uh, and when you're dealing dealing with abuse, um, it could be verbal, sexual. It could be, you know, uh, specific to trans. It could be specific. It could be, you know, a parent-child relationship. However you view it, um, the the problem of where do you what do you do when it's everywhere? Uh, I still didn't have that answer, and so the the conversation was relatively yeah. short. So I don't necessarily, uh, you know. I don't know now that I know what it was particularly about, or I have you know confidence of what it's particularly about. I don't know that uh, my answer would be much different because it's still a problem of what do you do when it's everywhere, you know. If I may, um, I think what what I would do personally, what, what happens usually when someone is going through something hard. I think they need to be listened to more than given advice. And I would have, I think the way I would have approached it was, so what happened? Um, can you share a little bit about your experience without needing to assume anything about where they're coming from, what's happening or what the context of their conversations were just to let them unload a little bit. And uh, cause I, I think when we are suffering, and we, I mean, if we raise our hand on, on Clubhouse, I think we want to be heard. So I think that that might have been a, a slightly better approach to just uh, perhaps do the role without trying to put on, you know, the th therapist hat or assuming that we, we have uh, the professional um, training to, to, to deal with someone who's going through hardship to just, you know, be a a friend who, who, who was willing to listen and, uh, and move from there. Uh, what do you guys, I, I certainly don't want to speak for Brenda and I don't think anybody here should speak for Brenda. Um, but I think it, there may be like a bigger, bigger issue that we could, that we could probably discuss that might be more beneficial um what i got from brenda was the um th this idea of privilege just in general like how does being somebody uh that has privilege affect how they um they conduct se or whether they should or or how that can affect um which which process they use or which method they use maybe maybe we can come out a little bit um and have a, a bigger scope of just privilege in general uh with with the time that we have left so yeah i think the thing about privilege is that it mostly gives you a, a lack of <clears throat> of information right to where when you have a privilege in some way in society, you tend to think that your path of getting there was easy because it was easy for you. And it's too simplistic to generalize when we're talking about something that is a much more chaotic and complicated system to assume that it's going to be just as easy or simple for everyone else involved like i have this idea for a character like a superhero with a power to always win and always succeed at whatever this individual does but it just so happens that this individual decided to take an interest in statistics 
And he realized that uh, somewhere along the way that all the luck that he has could just be a statistical outlier that you expect to happen at some point in time in some society somewhere, you're going to have somebody that's always winning. Because statistically, with the billions upon billions of people that will ever exist, it's just going to eventually happen. And so he's conflicted. Is it a superpower or is he just a statistical outlier? I don't know. What do you think, Eddie, about on, on the subject of privilege affecting uh, an SE conversation? Um, well, the idea is to, uh, if you're practicing SE, you are removing all of your conclusions and beliefs and trying to remain neutral and you're focusing on the person. So definitely if you, uh, if you have a privilege and you never could, uh, relate or understand, or it, you've never experienced something, um, and someone can tell you about it, uh, that that's definitely a, a benefit if you can just set aside your assumptions and, and, and just hear them out. So, um, if you, if you are, if your questions are, are being, um, molded by, uh, privilege or your previous beliefs or anything like that, however you want to frame it, that's coming from you, you probably aren't going to be listening to the person, at, you know, um, as much, as much as you could. So um, now that I'm thinking about it, I really think that um, this could have been a, a great platform to talk about something, you know, philosophical or address it in some way. Um, and so, you know, if you guys continue to have these, you know, these, uh, th these discussions, you know, I, th I think, um, for her, that would be hopefully, can, or will be, or continue to be a room where, you know, she can have these discussions somewhere to land, you know? Yeah. Hopefully Brenda will be back and we can try again. Um, anything else, Steve, while you're up here? Yeah, I, I, I think I can reassure you. I've known Brenda for a while. Um, I think she'll be back. Uh, she just, she is clearly in, in my view of my understanding of her. She, um, she, she probably just had to, to step away and collect herself, but she'll be able to come back and she'll have more conversations. Just, I don't know. It, it, it I just wanted to make sure you, you understood Eddie, if it did occur to you. Like it's okay to read between the lines and you should try to ask the right questions based on that. Well, let's just, let's just assume that, I, that, um, we did, we did know, and it was stated. I, I don't know if I had the answer right then, you know, I don't know if that knowing, knowing what the topic was about, I don't know how it, it could have, uh, um, affected my answer because that's a difficult problem when it's everywhere. You know, you, you were going but, to places that's, that you're constantly being abused and there's nowhere else you can go. Um, SE definitely isn't, you know, equipped to handle that problem. So my, my first instinct is, you know, get out of these abusive situations, which is, you know, not, you know, not a, an actual solution. Well, that's a, a, a bit of a meta that's worth, I think also, um, uh, uh, pointing out here is like we're talking about street epistemology and it's okay obviously in every circumstance to say I don't know we want to encourage that people admit that they don't know what they don't know um, so that's that's perfectly fine to say that you don't know the answer um, it it is a bit of a faux pas right in street epistemology or at least a risk that you're taking um, outside of the the idea if you ask or if you if you offer somebody an answer or a solution right because the whole idea is to like get at the path of like what are they thinking where are they coming from how did they arrive at their conclusions not not to suggest your own yeah i wasn't attempting to do se if that's what you're asking oh, okay cool i thought that was what the whole point was <laughs> no, no 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 we're talking about um se what it is questions and answers um 
And if you, if you wanted to conduct SE, it would have been like, hey, here's my belief claim. And then we can address the belief claim confidence. Uh, I took that uh, more of as general advice. And so if you want advice, you, you probably shouldn't go to an SE practitioner because we, we tend to try not to influence you in that way. We more like to ask questions and get you to reflect on the reliability of the method you're using to get to a belief, not not to uh, particularly solve a a problem such as you know abuse. So real Fair quick, uh, I'm going to let you respond real quick, Steve. Uh, we've got about nine minutes left, and we have uh, one more person in the audience that wants to come up on stage. So uh, any last thoughts, Steve, and um, and then we'll bring. Uh, Victoria back up yeah uh, fair enough I just wanted to uh, I, I, I I'd like to just close off with saying like I really did appreciate that Brenda put this this issue on the table that I think while straight epistemology does not pretend to um, be a solution for all things the fact that it is a methodology for trying to have civil conversations and there are people who cannot live their lives without being addressed abusively um, by somebody in some way or another um, that perhaps even more than just ignoring or you know uh, modding somebody out of the conversation um, when they are abusive maybe there's another solution to to discover you know as we keep parsing this out and refining our our methods Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here, Steve. And thanks for coming up on stage to, to share. No problem. Have a good one. All right. Um, going to bring Brenda up here, or sorry, Victoria up. Um, I think you had a question for Steve. Uh, I would recommend maybe finding Steve in a room if you want to have a conversation with them, but uh, go ahead and share what you, if you'd like to share something, uh, uh, just whatever your thoughts are. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I know Steve, I've shared lots of spaces with him, so I've already back channeled him a little bit and we can have a, a conversation. Um, I guess not being on stage and not knowing Brenda, I, I come from a, a total observer um, uh, perspective. And, um, I, I guess I, I feel for everybody who had a, a bit of a say there for Steve, Brenda and, um, Eddie. And, um, from my perspective, um, it, it would have been great for her to stay. And, and if she weren't, if she were in a, a state of mind that there could have been some street epistemology, on her belief that there was nowhere for her to go, which I understand completely would have been a, probably a difficult conversation, but it may have also benefited her because I, I have a belief that there is places for her to go, that there are places for her to go. Um, and because I've seen that and I've shared space with a, a lot of trans people here on this app uh, who have also said they've been in rooms where they've been abused, but it hasn't been a hundred percent of rooms. Um, but you know, what I would say about Eddie is she came up with the, uh, I, I don't know what her intention is, but it sounded like it wasn't about street epistemology. It was about the, the, the title can, um, you know, street epistemology can improve conversations. And it just sounded like um, she was uh, experiencing conversations that needed much improvement. Um, and uh, and I didn't really hear a question. It was more of an accusation, not about Eddie or about this room, but just in general. And um, when when she didn't get what she needed, and I don't know what that was, um, it it just sort of derailed from there. So I just wanted to get up to say um, that I, I think that we can have compassion for all the people involved here, and um, and hopefully she will come back, and there will be a chance for her to either learn about street epistemology a little bit more, um, which might help in conversations, um, and to learn, you know, that 
that Eddie, I didn't think you were practicing street epistemology. I thought that you were just being a good person by saying, you know, please disengage from abusive spaces. So uh, that's all I wanted to say was just to give my support to the people involved in that conversation because I I understand from from all perspectives it was probably really difficult. Yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to uh, express right off the bat was that, you know, SE is about like keeping very sensitive topics at a, you know, a, a so uh, they, they, um, they, they are productive conversations, but it, it's not designed to um, absorb or deflect uh, an already heated conversation. So it's not like, you know, if, if a heated conversation is happening and people are, you know, abusing each other uh, verbally, SE can come in and diffuse the situation. It, 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 that, that's just not uh, feasible. I think what it does is allow a space in which you can have a conversation that doesn't, you know, uh, uh, de or doesn't become defensive uh, based off it, the nature of the topic. You know, we're, we're talking about sensitive topics. And so I definitely didn't want her to leave with the impression that SE could do this because it, it definitely can't. And so my only advice would be something other than SE, um, which was, you know, I leave the abusive situation. Uh, real quick, um, I know, Eddie, you've got a hard out coming in about three minutes. Uh, so I just wanted to respect your time and, and mention that. Um, so I, I just want to go ahead and take this opportunity to thank everyone that participated today. Thanks, Eddie, for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, it was it was great. This a, this was a good room. Um, I appreciate you also, Alfonso, for for being here always and early for facilitating um, earlier uh, in the room. Uh, so yeah, uh, any last thoughts, Eddie or Alfonso, before we uh, before we end the room? I just wanted to thank everyone for for having me and uh, um, and thank you for the discussion and some very good questions. Yeah, thanks Eddie for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, yeah, I just want to remind everyone we have these rooms every Saturday. Um, so feel free to follow the Street Epistemology Club and. Uh, the events that are scheduled, you can press the bell icon to be reminded when they're coming up and when they when these rooms open. Um, yeah, and, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, as always, David. Uh, you're on, you're an amazing room. Awesome. Yeah, I, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Um, on the Saturday uh, thing. Um, some people may have noticed that next Saturday is Christmas Day and the following Saturday is New Year's Day. So we're going to be taking a little bit of a break from Saturday specific SE 101 rooms. Uh, although I hope to be in some pop up uh, SE rooms here and there in the meantime. So uh, I didn't want anybody to come back next Saturday and not, and not find us. So, um, yeah. So. Uh, Eddie, real quick, we have one person left that has their hand raised. I want to give you the opportunity to take that question if you want to. I know that you've got to get going, but um, if you'd like, we can bring Jeff up. Uh, it's up to you, depending on on your schedule. It, it, no big deal either way. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Awesome. Okay, I will bring Jeff up. And welcome back to the room and to the stage, Jeff. Good to see you. Hey, hey, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yes. loud and clear. Good. Hey, Eddie, I really appreciate it. I, I, I've been following you for a while, of course, after Anthony. But um, something I noticed you said a few times was that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think you focus on street epistemology as a way to have conversations about difficult topics is that is it is that right kind of yeah the, the topics in general are are very um sensitive and you know uh and they tend to be beliefs that are 
part of someone's identity. And so it's very difficult to talk to talk about them uh, with anybody, you know, without, uh, or I mean, not anybody, but you know, when there's, um, there's when when there's a subject of it, if it being true or not true, or, you know, something like that, mm. when it's a part of your identity, it, it could be very, um, very sensitive. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I've been thinking more lately of the effect that practicing SE has had on me as a practitioner. And, um, and yes, it's a tool. And I'm wondering, um, as as a community, what what are your thoughts of of us us thinking? And, and I heard Anthony uh, a few times talking about how he wants people who are religious to start practicing street epistemology. When he first said that, I couldn't it didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, what is he talking? What? And now I understand because as a practitioner, um, so I've become more focused on me, and 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 open to to, to wanting to change my mind about anything. And it seems like maybe you have a different approach, is, or, or am I a misunderstanding? No, I would say I would say I agree with that. I remember talking to Anthony about this um, years ago. That as I practice SE, um, and I mean you're invited into someone's um, someone's head and all the reasons they have for you know a particular belief and. <clears throat> Uh, you interact with them in a way that it is very hard not uh, not to have empathy for them, to sympathize with them, and uh, and so if you are someone who um, is getting into SE because you like to see it combat a certain belief, like a belief in God or you know a belief um, in you know a ghost or what what have you. Um, that is one side of, of the coin, but the other, when you practice it, it is, it is a, it is a very personal conversation. Mm. And so, uh, I, when, how much, when how, I much how much, of an, how much of an impact has it had on you personally? It, it has a lot of impact because I basically have stopped debating people on certain subjects because I have a better understanding of the real reasons or uh, what, what what the general uh, I have a better understanding of why someone might hold a belief mm. like I don't always know but mm. I have a, an, a better understanding that it, it is you know something that could very much affect their life in, in a you know positive or negative way mm. and uh, I basically have stopped pretending as if me arguing as someone is going to do anything other than satisfy my ego. Oh man, that's so great because yes, that yes, I'm, I'm, I'm so much there and it's been such a transformation and it's still taking place for me. And, it's, and so, yeah. And so for me, I, I'm, the whole thing is, is, is introspective at this point where it, it once it wasn't. So that's, my my evolution of, of of my view of street epistemology is is changing, and and I think and and so you guys are this, this is just fantastic. I, um, uh, the this whole community is uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, I, yeah, I I I feel like I have a place that I, that I belong somehow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like that's, that's awesome, weird. Yeah. But I've always been curious, but and and and, and after deconstructing my my faith, I uh, long for this community, and now I found these people that want to ask questions, and um, it's just yeah, I appreciate it, guys. I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> that's Jeff. awesome. That's awesome. That uh, thanks for that, Jeff. That that's a really good um, that's a really good stop to or a place to stop. <laughs> so. Yeah, again, everybody, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for being in the room, participating. Uh, and we'll see you around. Take it easy, guys. Bye. And there you have it. want to thank Petty for coming into the room today. Also... 
Alfonso for being here. Early for facilitating. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and would like to join the conversation or just listen in, you can find us on the Clubhouse discussion app in the Street Epistemology Club. Until next time, keep asking questions.